Cheesehead TV brings you two guys who like to think they know something about football! Fresh off his appearance last evening on the NFL Network, Tom Pelissero from the Green Bay Press Gazette joins us. Tom, thanks for being here. Anytime. Tom Pelissero in the house on Cheesehead Nation. Uh, first off, uh, from your practice reports today, uh, you're saying that Rodgers looked really sharp. Um, just, I, think, I, I guess, to start off with, sharp in uh, deep, intermediate, uh, just spraying the ball all over the place. Uh, was there something specific that you thought uh, he looks better than last year at this time? It, the things that always jump out to me, especially when you're going through the installations. You know, Mike McCarthy has said it before. Some days the offense is going to have an advantage. Sometimes the defense is going to have an advantage. What I always look for is when they blitz, when they're in the blitz periods, um, you know, how is Rodgers getting the football out and where is he going with it? And there were a couple of throws today that just jumped out at me. You know, there was one I wrote about it in the blog, which was they blitzed um, off the right edge. So, in other words, Rodgers' blind side. And he whipped the pass. I mean, I couldn't even see Rodgers from where I was. All I saw was the ball come over the defender's head directly to Donald Driver. I mean, you're talking throwing the ball before the guy's even thinking about getting out of his break. And it was on the money. And then later... They bring a corner blitz again from Rodgers' blind side, and he spins and hits the guy in the slot, you know, in a third down situation. It's throws like that that you can tell that Rodgers is just so much, so far ahead of the other quarterbacks and really ahead of a lot of guys on the football field this time of year. Nice. Very, very good. And on those, uh, you mentioned the blitzes uh, from his blind side. Are these number ones? Are these like, is this one against one, or is this mixing guys in and out? Is there, oh, it's usually the ones against the ones. That's generally how they run it. Um, basically, the practice structure most of the time is 3-2-1. In other words, the ones go, go against the ones for three plays, the twos against the twos for two plays, and then the threes against the threes for one play. But, yeah, it's all ones versus ones this time of year. Excellent. Uh, speaking of the defense blitzing or not, um, uh, Nick Collins, uh, obviously still not there. Uh, do you see uh, and uh, Smith from Pittsburgh uh, making uh, – I guess taking advantage of the situation, is he standing out at all? I mean, obviously he knows the defense a lot better than most of the guys on the team, uh, basically from where he's come from and the fact that he's been there the whole time. Uh, is he taking advantage of that situation? Well, I mean, it's tough to tell. Obviously, in OTAs, you know, it's funny. Somebody actually I was standing there and somebody asked him, do you feel like this is a situation that you can really benefit from? And he said, no, not really, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> it's, it's June and it's shorts. And these guys are aware of what it is. You know, the, the coaching staff knows what Smith is capable of. Certainly, he's an athlete. I got to spend some time with him today, and, he, you know, he's a good talker. He's a guy who will definitely open up. You know, as far as on the football field, it's really tough to tell right now, but certainly he's running with the ones. Him and Rouse are uh, running as the one-two safeties right now because uh, Collins isn't here, and, and Bigby's been hurt too. But, you know, do I see Smith being able to get into the lineup? Probably not at this point. You know, it's tough to imagine that there's going to be enough of a change that uh, that he'd be able to get in there. But you never know. I mean, the longer Collins stays away, the more he's hurting himself and the more he's hurting the team. Absolutely. I mean, the the knock obviously is that he's not there. He's not studying. It's a new defense, and uh, his his play seemed to taper off a little bit towards the end of last year. Uh, speaking of the secondary, you wrote today that Pat Lee was uh, looking good and making some plays. Uh, Mostly, uh, what, was he blanketing guys? Was he playing zone? Was he playing man? What about Pat Lee stood out for you today? Well, there's a lot of zone concepts in the scheme. You know, without breaking it down too much schematically, he just seemed to react well. He's picking up guys. Um, you know, and frankly, he just made some plays. I mean, he jumped. I think one of them was a, a like a shallow cross to Donald Driver. He jumped in front of that, batted that down. There was another one that he really had to accelerate when he was lined up over the slot and, and batted a pass away uh, near the perimeter. Yeah, I mean, the, the guy has all the physical ability. You know, there's a reason he was a second-round draft pick. they got to hope that he can at least come up and win that dime. And it, it's pretty hard to, to handicap right now who's in, like, the four or the five slot. But Lee's right in there. You know, really after the, after the top three guys, you got uh, Will Blackman, Pat Lee, and, and Joe Porter are probably the next three in. And I'd say they definitely want Lee to at least be that number four guy. They'd rather let Blackman concentrate on returns and be kind of an emergency guy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Who do you see? I know they're running Nelson and uh, James Jones uh, pretty evenly at camp, uh, or I'm sorry, at OTAs. Who do you see ultimately winning that, that battle? You know, I make this point every time somebody asks me that, which is I don't think that it's really a battle per se because they use those guys differently, and they're different sorts of receivers. Right. I think that Jones is the better receiver. 
Um, he's got maybe a little bit better quickness than when he's full speed. He's looked great. Jones is one of the guys who's absolutely jumped out at me. Just looking at him physically, he looks like he's a little bit leaner than he was even when he was in really good shape in 2007. You know, he looks lean. He's moving so much better than he was any time last year when he was dealing with that uh, PCL or LCL or whatever it was right. in his knee. The knee. Right. Um, you know, and Nelson is a big guy. He's a good blocker. They like to use him on the perimeter and create some mismatches out there. I think that they'll end up using both guys. You know, I don't know that it's necessarily a number three, number four thing. You know, they liked when they went three tight last year using Nelson out on the edge because, right. again, he's a good blocker. They run a lot out of that formation. And also he, he creates a mismatch. He put a smaller corner on him, whereas Jones... I think maybe could end up seeing more of the reps, in, you know, in three wide formations, like your regular three wide formations. But yeah, both guys are, are in the mix now. Is there room for Ruval Martin if Jordy Nelson keeps uh, progressing as a blocker? That that I don't know. I don't know what Ruval Martin's role would be. Um, uh, just a couple quick questions, Tom. Thanks so much for being here yeah, tonight. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, we'll just we'll throw a couple random uh, things that we've we've had come in. Uh, Brian at Railbird Central wanted to know. Uh, Mike McCarthy talked about. Uh, training safeties to play left and right instead of weak and strong uh do you th does it continue that way during the season or is it just a learning purpose i mean do they do that just for camp or is well, that just like a base I, I, of the I defense th i think that's part of it basically the thing is with the way the safeties play in this scheme they have to be somewhat interchangeable because on a given play based on the, the alignment of the offense and motions and whatnot the strong safety can become the free and the free be can become the right. strong safety right. So by training them left and right, they learn just to see it from the vision point sure. versus from the, okay, I'm the strong safety, oh, no, now I've got to flip. This way they can just have the vision be playing a position, you know, a spot on the field, right. and then based on the adjustment, they're not having to think about who's what. So right. you know, it, it's probably a learning tool more than anything, but really the safety is going to be a lot more interchangeable, and everybody's going to have to play in space. Everyone's going to have to play in the box. I think, I think Packer fans just got really worried because – you know, that's all uh, Bob Sanders would talk about was how the safeties were interchangeable. So, and I recognize they're totally different schemes. I just think that that sentence really scared some people. Yeah, I don't know how much you really saw Nick Collins consistently up in the box under Bob Sanders. Bob Sanders' scheme was, was significantly <laughs> different than what they're doing now. The the volume of what they're taking on um, right. is certainly different. Absolutely. And one last quick question before we go. Uh, a little before you were talking about the media scrutiny in the Green Bay area. Uh, obviously, there's lots and lots and lots of. Uh, Followers both at Green Bay Press Gazette and your competitors, you know the Journal Sentinel and uh, uh, there's you know, Jason uh, down in uh, Madison. Uh, do you how much of your competition do you read? How, how much of it, uh, you know, do you talk about with other beat guys? Do you do you all go out for a beer? You know what, what what's the camaraderie slash competition like uh, amongst your uh, Packer beat guy brethren, so to speak? Well, there's certainly people who are more competitive and more cutthroat than others, you know, without a doubt. You read everything because, or I read everything at least, because right. you just want to know what else is out there, and you want to be able to find unique angles on the story. If, if you write a story on the guy, and you take the exact same angle as something that was done two days ago by a different paper, because you didn't know, then you're not doing your job, and you're not taking, you know, the the side angle and, and finding something new to deliver to readers who, who do consume everything that's out there. I'm sure there's you know, other writers, guys who have been at this for 30 years, 40 years, who don't read other people because they feel that they have the authority and it's not official until they write it. <laughs> you know, and for, I don't and know I'm who you're talking about. Names, but there's, it's obvious. I don't you know, know who you're talking there's, about. There's people who do that. So, you know, everybody has their different way of doing it. And, you know, some people have been very successful doing it a certain way for a long time. Um, I think I'm probably a little bit different being the age I am and coming into this one I am where I take – you know, I'm on Twitter and I'm blogging and I'm doing all this different sorts of stuff because, I, you know, I think that's the direction that it has to go and it's not necessarily, you know, the traditional, the traditional mindset. So, you know, connecting with uh, bloggers, I don't think that's something that you're going to see uh, some people doing, but I'm more than willing to talk to you guys. That's awesome. We love it. Yeah, and you're, you're so great for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, thanks for answering our question. Sorry for the sorry for the fact that it's not actually live, but we'll throw it up a little later, and uh, everyone will get to hear it's it. It's going to go up right away, though. Tom Pelissero, ladies and gentlemen. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. All right, fellas. See you.